Welcome to Thinking Green, I'm Rana, and we are actually back live tonight. And um, the inspiration for tonight's show was uh, about a couple of weeks ago, Neil Young uh, pulled his uh, music from Spotify uh, in reaction to Joe Rogan's anti-vax uh, statements. And that kind of rekindled a uh, discussion that goes on and off a lot of the time about censorship, uh, cancel culture, uh, boycotts, and people lined up on both sides of the issue. And so at that point, I decided to invite um, New London's most censored individual to be- uh, The world's, the world's most. <laughs> yeah. and, and talk about censorship from someone who really has experienced it. I'm so, the expert. <laughs> yeah, so Mike Alowitz, who is a political muralist who lives in New London and has been censored worldwide as our guest tonight. And he was on the show talking about censorship like seven or eight years ago, and time flies, but it seems like more than ever it's time to talk about it. This is one of the few venues I've, I've been permitted on. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Greens in New London. Um, we don't invite everyone either. I there are some people that we, you know, we kind of choose. Uh, I feel very honored. Well. I feel very honored. I don't know if you should feel honored, but we, we do we do have standards. You know, we do try to have guests on that deserve to be heard and are likely not to be heard through mainstream means. So uh, the show is live if people want to call in, but we will also be posting it on YouTube within the next day or two. So welcome, Mike. And uh, maybe before we start looking at at, at photographs, uh, I, I think that we're going to really kind of look through uh, your mural, uh, The City on the Crossroads of History, which I don't think we did talk about last time you were on Wasn't the show. It, it didn't it, exist? Oh, so you have a new censorship <laughs> story. <laughs> this and, is a big one, too. <laughs> and um, maybe you can talk a little bit about your experience with this particular mural. Okay, well, uh, of course, I have a long history of being censored, and I've had, when you do the kind of work that I do, I do agitprop murals um, that are political, that are part of different strikes and struggles. And when you do that, uh, you cross a line. You're no longer part of the art world. And my work has been censored all over the place. I've had them bulldozed, painted over, sandblasted, um, you name it. And as far as I know, I'm the most censored artist in the world. Um, I'm, I'm so censored, I'm not in the censorship books. I'm not a footnote in a censorship book. But this last one was a doozy. Um, I was commissioned to do a piece for a gallery that was being installed in the Museum of the City of New York. And I was commissioned by the Puffin Foundation, which is progressive, uh, foundation, gives a lot of money to different uh, left causes, uh, to paint a mural. I designed a mural. It's called The City at the Crossroads of History. Um, and it went before a very prestigious panel of people. The people from the foundation loved it. The um, people on the committee loved it. It included the publisher of uh, Nation magazine, it had intellectuals on it, everybody uh, 
love the mural. I put a lot of work into it. I thought it was a very good piece of work. Still is a good piece of work, and, it, and you can see it still at Red Square in New London. Um, then, after going through all that, uh, the then director of the Museum of the City of New York, who has close ties with the financial institutions of New York, just simply refused to install it. And the way these things work, because I've been through this before, I did a major work about Harriet Tubman, for example, in, in Baltimore, w where the same thing happened. What happened is that people, the people in the nonprofits all respond to funding. So the museum, the Puffin Foundation wouldn't just collapse. They're not going to stand up to the museum. And then everybody's quiet because Puffin gives them money. So I call up Democracy Now! and say, hey, you know, this is a major deal. This is, uh, uh, they refuse to install this mural. This hasn't happened since Diego Rivera uh, did his thing. And, well, Puffin gave them $100,000. They're not going to have me on to talk about the thing. And this is, this is, People are afraid of the funny, and that's one of the ways that this stuff is controlled. Um, at court, we had a petition online. If you go to change.org, there's a petition you can sign, and you can do different things. But the reality of it is, is this is who gets censored. This is, this is what real censorship is. And the reason it's censored is because it has images of working people, and it's about working people, and it's very clearly uh, supporting the, the struggles of working people. That's how you get censored. Uh, Joe Rogan's not being censored, he c and uh, you can't get $100 million and be censored. Um, and a lot of PR about complaining about being censored. Yeah, well, th that's, who, that's what they complain about, and there's this whole thing about cancel culture which is non-existent. There, it does, there is no cancel culture. The only cancel culture there is is people like me who are just written out of um, any kind of art uh, world and, of course, the great mass of working people who are canceled. Um, in, the, in the mass media, there's no shows about working people. If you turn on any, if you watch any television show, there's no workers. Um, they're invisible. The people who feed us, the people who clothe us, the people who make our transportation, um, they don't exist. You turn out, you watch TV shows, it's lawyers, it's cops, it's people sitting around in apartments in New York City that don't have to pay rent. It's, it's, um, we're just completely invisible. Um, and so when you do work with immigrant workers, a lot of the stuff I do is with people like immigrant workers, then you become invisible too. And uh, so that's, that's the real cancel. Um, and when all this stuff about cancel culture and censorship is it's really ultimately directed against the left and it, it, it tries, it creates an atmosphere where people self-censor themselves, where people are afraid to do things. Um, because they think something's going to happen to them. It sounds sort of also, uh, if a person didn't even want to put it in terms of left and right, it's like the powerful against the powerless. Like where the money lies, where the power lies, they, they're the ones who get to control the message. Well, yeah. I mean, there's a handful of media companies. I mean, I'm in, uh, 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 I'm in a theatrical union. Uh, that just went through a big fight, Yahtzee. Um, and the entertainment industry is a huge industry in the United States, and it's a huge export industry. When you look at how many media companies there are, there's like three or four. Ultimately, everything is owned by this little handful uh, of families and, and, and investors. And so that's how we get our media. That's how we see images. That's what's shaping, that's what shapes the discussion. Right now, the ruling class is interested in provoking confrontation, or some parts of the ruling class interested in provoking a confrontation uh, with Russia and others with China. So what are we bombarded with? Russia this, Russia that, you know, and uh, they're trying to whip up a war hysteria, and they're the ones who control the media 
and it's pervasive through all, all of the media. It's everywhere. And it's not the first time in history that's happening. This is a recurring story. It certainly is not. So let's take a look at your mural that no one can see except, <laughs> in, <laughs> except where you live. Uh, so um, we can see this is, now it's, it, it looks like it's big. Well, those are life-size figures. Um, so this is one of the problems with showing murals on a screen is that, you know, a lot of it has to do with the scale of the thing. Um, but it's, it's um, you know, it's, you're looking at something that's like 16 or 18 feet high. And those figures, the way that was designed, really, the, because of my history, even though they assured me that there would be no problem doing this mural, um, the, the, the Puffin people said, "Don't we're, we're paying for this. They're paying over a million dollars to renovate this gallery. So it's going to go in, don't you worry. Well, I paint, normally I paint everything on site. I would go to the museum and I would paint the mural. I painted this on canvas panels. I've been around to, so I could not believe, despite the insurances, despite the committee, despite all this stuff, I could not believe that the city of New York was going to put my imagery up on the wall. And it, when you look at the imagery, you can see why. Um, so, so I did it on canvas panels. And really, that bottom piece with all the figures, those are revolutionary figures and, and activists with the history of New York. But a lot of them, of course, had national importance. Uh, that was just kind of a. That's not the most important part of the mural. That's just where, that's where the photo op takes place. Now, we do have pictures of the panels in some detail. So um, this, we can like, talk about it, and people can really see it. The first well, panel is, uh, yes, the Hell of Exploitation. This is called the Hell of Exploitation. So you're looking at something that's um, about 5 by 7 feet or 4 by 7, whatever it is. And really, in here, you can see why they, why the financial institutions of New York would not want this. First of all, you see the slaves arriving at Wall Street. And we actually have a. Oh, okay. Wall Street was actually where slaves landed in New York City, and they took the slaves off the ship. Now, people have probably seen an image like this of the slave ship, uh, because. Since, since the rise of the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Power Movement in the 1960s, we're able to see these images now, although I don't know that it's been painted anywhere on a wall. And so there's the slave ship arriving um, in Manhattan. And this is, this is where the wealth of, of the uh, super-rich families in this country comes from. It comes from the exploitation of slave labor. It comes from the extermination of the indigenous people. And it comes from the drug trade. Um, those are basically uh, the, three, the three pillars uh, that generated the initial capital for this great industrial power to emerge. If we go up to the next slide, um, that's Oda Benga, who was, uh, he was a, 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 a uh, Congolese pygmy. He was an African, an African worker. Uh, up into the 50s, up into the 1950s, um, African families and families from Polynesia, things like that, were kept in zoos as exhibits. Well, and that's within our lifetime. Yes. Oda Benga, who I painted in there, was kept in the monkey house at the Bronx Zoo. And I put that in there because these institutions, which, you know, always profess to have the moral high ground of these things, they were all, these institutions arose through the same mechanisms. It was, it was enslaved labor that provided the capital that then the wealthy could turn around and say, well, I'm giving something to the city after they've basically stolen it from working people. And uh, he eventually got out. He, he, he danced one of his indigenous dance and committed suicide. And I wanted to put Oda Benga in there. This is, this is um, 
the, the early colonists with um, the, the extermination of the Lenape and other Indians that were on Man Manhattan and the surrounding areas. Um, there, were, there were all these cultures that existed here. There were millions of people that were in the Western Hemisphere. There were buildings larger than anything that existed in Europe. There were also foragers and hunter-gatherers. There's very complex uh, societies in the Americas, and they were, uh, to a large extent, exterminated or driven off the land, including putting, putting uh, people's heads on pikes and playing games with them. Um, it, was, it was a horror. It was one of the other horrors. And basically, the land was just stolen. Um, that's all the land where I'm we are. I'm starting to see part of the motivation for keeping this out of <laughs> the New York Museum, though, you know, we are hearing people talking about uh, reparations and, uh, you know, and some kind of compensation or, or, or restoration of the land that was stolen, and uh, this is like fuel to that fire. Well, it, it, not that it shouldn't be, but well, you're going to see it keeps going. <laughs> It <laughs> keeps going up okay. there. Child labor. Uh, child labor existed until basically the rise of uh, industrial unions, uh, organized labor. And uh, where we are in New York and in New England, you know, if you ever go into these old mill buildings, you, the steps are short because, um, you know, it was all child labor. It was women and children who worked in the textile industry. They had whipping rooms. They had whipping rooms. They would whip the children. Children would work, you know, 16, 18 hours a day. This is where, this is another way that this enormous wealth was generated. So I put child laborers in. This is the hell of exploitation. This is the real history. This is the Triangle Fire. Some people have heard of the Triangle Fire. Um, this was, this became famous. Um, because it, it, it was a, a textile plant in New York, and uh, it, was, it was in the city, and there were crowds of people. When a fire broke out, there were no safety procedures. I don't want to get into the whole story of it, but basically, these poor women who were trapped in this unsafe building uh, were leaping out of the building in flames and, and to their deaths below. And it was su such a stark thing that it, it actually um, gave a lot of impetus to the organization of textile workers' unions and to some of the first legislation that, that protects workers. Um, I mean, when things are bad now, and they are bad for a lot of workers, um, but because of the unions, because of the very militant strikes and struggles that took place during the course of the history of this country, um, it is much, much better. I mean, people were treated like beasts. They were just treated like beasts. They had no rights at all in the workplace. Keep going up there. Okay. And then we get to the top, right? <laughs> and there's, there's, that's the source of the wealth. And if you notice, I have lynched bodies hanging off of them. Um, Lynching is not, was not the way they portray it on television. It wasn't a handful of bad guys riding up to cabin at night to take somebody away. This was a campaign of mass terror directed against uh, primarily African Americans. Um, lynchings were public, often public spectacles. They would have picnics. There were, there were lynchings where thousands of people came. They would uh, uh, burn the body of an African American. People would tear off pieces of the flesh uh, to take as souvenirs. And this is, again, where the wealth of this country comes from. And people think, oh, well, that was hundreds of years ago. No, it wasn't. Um, now, I'm an old man, granted, but I grew up in a semi-rural area in a, in a housing project outside Wilmington, Delaware, Joe Biden state. And it completely segregated. Uh, my family was involved in helping to desegregate the University of Delaware. When I, was, when I was a kid, everything was segregated. 
And right next to our little housing project of, you know, working class people was a, a youth prison farm that was all black kids where they had put them in chicken coops. And my, my folks who were, who were political, I, it's one of my earliest memories uh, when, when, we, um, when they, we got this place in Delaware. Uh, they took me, they took the family, <laughs> my parents, to the Delaware workhouse where they still had the whipping post. It was still legal to whip. This is like in the 1950s. This is, yeah, this is the 1950s. Probably into the early 60s. Um, I, yeah, it was probably, I mean, they hadn't used it for a while uh, because the civil rights movement was starting. Um, and so all of this stuff, uh, these near slave-like conditions existed until the, until the end of World War II and the beginning of the civil rights movement. And there were areas near where I lived where it was like shacks. You know, Delaware was a poor area. Um, so this isn't in our distant past. Um, and it's still going on. And it's still going on. And um, instead of lynchings as mass terror, you have police shootings. Um, that, that has taken the place of it. Because the U.S., Ruling class, for its own interests, does not want to look as crude as it really is. So it, it tries to dress itself up. Uh, and it does that in a lot of ways. It, it tries to look like a democracy, right? Well, policing is quite the interesting topic. And I don't want to get too far afield. But it seems as though whatever budget woes a city is suffering from, policing does not get cut. Policing in the military. There's always it's, it's never a debate about anything when it comes to the military. And the Democrats, who are supposed to be the liberals, including squads and Sanders and all the rest of them, uh, they give they give them more money than they ask for. Any anything they want, they get. Any any and it's all cost plus. You know, trillions of dollars go into this death machine, and it's never a question. Well, those of us in Connecticut, I remember in the uh, 80s, uh, late 80s, when uh, EB around here uh, was downsizing quite a bit, and it was recommended to whoever was the CEO at the time, I think it might have been Margaliotis or whatever, and had asked, well, what about diversifying into other kinds of manufacturing? And he basically said, no, no, we can only, we can only function under a cost-plus system. Well, you know, you could. Uh, when At the beginning of World War II, the U.S. had no army. It really had nothing. And overnight, they militarized the entire country. This is one of the reasons we don't have national health care, why we don't have a labor party in this country. Um, the workforce was totally militarized, and overnight they began producing thousands of bombers. You could do the same thing in reverse. You could be making trolley cars over there. Right. But we should get back to yeah, censorship. Yeah, let's get back to the... Because um, you and I could talk about all kinds of things all night right, long here. We, we could. Okay. So let me, let, I, I, let me make the essential thing about this. If, if it wasn't Mike Alowitz doing revealing the truth about where these things come from. The idea that a major commissioned mural is refused, they refused to hang it up on totally political grounds. They didn't, tr they, they said, you know, it's the, it's the politics of the thing. They wanted me to put Curtis Seawine there. The, you know, this, you know they, it was just, it, it was, they were, uh, unfortunately, you realize that the heads of these, <laughs> like the heads of the museum, it's art illiterate, doesn't know anything about art, whatever. But, um, you know, it was directly on political grounds, and yet not a word from the art community, not a word from the labor movement, not a word from the labor officials. Only rank and file people protest this thing. The idea of something like this, you compare that to say um, this woman who did something in Havana, the performance artist who did something in Havana, front page all over the world, right? Um, 
you know, if, if, if uh, you know, this is, it's all very revealing about uh, the way art works in this country and who really gets, gets censored, you know. Um, the fact that all this could be met with silence. When I painted a mural with striking meat packers and it was destroyed, silence, invisible. When I painted about Harriet Tubman in Baltimore and it got censored, it was in the regular press, but nothing in the art press, nothing from the liberals. Wow. They just disappear. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's uh, if, if you do this kind of work, if you do agitprop work like this, you are canceled. You are <laughs> just gone. And I guess if you're really canceled if no one knows about you. Yeah. No, of course. Well, you know, they... They, they know your name. Well, that, I don't care about that. It's, it, it becomes part of the collective consciousness of people, you know, because it involves a lot of people. Um, you know, I, I went to, I painted a mural in Israel that was knocked down by the Israeli Defense Forces. All these people were involved in it. Um, is it going to get covered? Did, uh, did anyone in the U.S. art world say anything about it? No. But it's out there. It's part of the collective consciousness. Um, a lot of the things that we do as activists, and especially if you're a, a, a revolutionary socialist, um, of course, it's 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 invisible. They used to call it. They used to call it. They were referred to as the people with no names. I paint for the people with no names, um, and. I paint for textile workers and I paint for, for meat packers and people like that. I, I love doing it and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, I'm a little more limited these days. But no, you're not, you're just, you're not considered, it's not considered art. It's, you're not considered part of the art world. Is that most always the case? I mean, when, I don't know. I mean, I'm thinking the, the post office murals are tame compared to what you paint, but I wonder if any of the murals done during the Depression had that political edge and were allowed to stand. No. They <laughs> weren't. Okay. <laughs> well, that was my question. No. I mean, well, you pointed out, if you go into the post office, I mean, there's some nice, there's some, interestingly, mural painting in the U.S. was not it didn't really arise organically from working people. This has always been a, a musical country. Um, working people, uh, that's our gift to the world. U.S. Get, has given the world two things, war, and from primarily African American community, but also from other indigenous people, Latinos, and, and all immigrant workers, created amazing music, rock and roll, blues, jazz, you name it. Um, that's our gift to the world. Not so much in the visual arts. And in the 1930s, what artists did, and many of them were well-intentioned, was they kind of copied what the Mexicans were doing. You know, there's a lot of heroic workers, people with kinds of muscles, this kind of thing. Now, go forward in time. When I came to Connecticut, to teach mural painting at Central Connecticut State University. This is in the year 2000, and it was when wild style lettering and graffiti was reaching in height. And all over the world, but especially out of the United States, along with breakdancing, along with hip hop, came graffiti, wild style lettering, spray can art. That was the first and greatest mass artistic movement hmm. of working people, uh, expression of working people in this country, which then, which spread all over the world. Any country of the world, if you say Mozambique street art and you Google it, you're going to get something, just anywhere. And so we had some great graffiti artists in New Britain, um, just turned out that way. And so I thought, well, we should have a course on street art. So um, I went to see how people taught street art. There was nobody. There was one course in street art, and it was at Central Connecticut State University. 
along with the only neural pain you cause. Now, explain to me how you can have the largest visual art movement in human history, never anything like this, in the visual arts, and yet there's not a course in this thing. Right. You know, this is, and what is wild style? It's abstract expressionist art, but it comes from working people. It has a different edge to it, a very different edge. And it wasn't to be sold, it was to be created, right? So, and they went after the graffiti artists. The cops were relentless after the graffiti. We had trouble at CCSU even when we had mural slams and stuff. Um, for a long time, and, and still to this day in most parts of the world, making art is illegal. If you go out onto the street to make art, it's illegal. They killed a, a graffiti artist um, in New York, a guy named Michael Stewart. Uh, Eleven transit cops beat him to death. In New Britain, automatic, you go to jail. Any kid they pick up, that's it, you're going to jail. And now what they've done is they've co-opted a lot of that, and that's what you see, and I think y you had asked me um, about that earlier. Um, now what they've done is they've, tamed it. it. It's like what they did with rock and roll. You know, you had rock and roll with people right. like you know, Little Richard and, you know, people like that, and then they give you Pat Boone, right? So there's always this back right, and well forth. Well, the 60s music was all that. I, I think even Saturday Night Live had parodied it. They had their four freshman <laughs> group that, <laughs> that, 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 that did white, you know, bleached covers of, of, of R&D. And, and that's what happened with street art. But it's always back and forth. There's still, there's always, because artists, if you're really trying to make art, you have to be a, re, it has to be rebellious. Otherwise, what you're doing, uh, the, great art, the great writer Mary Delasseur had wrote a wonderful thing, and I, I, I love to quote it. She says, they want you to perfume the sewers. <laughs> they want you to perfume the sewers. They want all these towns now, they have these mural programs. They want to make it look pretty. They want to cover the stench of, of what they're doing to human beings. And so that it's a carrot and stick, right? And now the carrot is, you know, here, we'll give you some money. Um, paint something that's, that's, you know, paint flowers or whatever. You know, now what they do is, is uh, paint, uh, Paint diversity on the wall. So you have an image of diversity so that you don't actually have to do anything to create diversity. You don't, you're not providing uh, uh, high paying jobs to African Americans, Latinos. You paint them on a wall, you see. And that's what they use it for. And uh, these, these um, mural programs are very consciously done. In fact, I, I Art has always been very consciously uh, organized by the ruling class of this country. Uh, the CIA is involved in this stuff, especially uh, after World War II with the rise of the abstract expressionist movement. This is how it, it was presented to the world. The United States is a free country. You can do all this crazy stuff with your art, right? Because in response to the colonial revolution and stuff. It's always been very political. So there's always back and forth. Um, now, I've, s I've noticed, for example, uh, the moment you had started having Black Lives Matter and, um, you know, some oppositional stuff, people start to go out and paint again, more meaningful things. In fact, a whole new art form has emerged of, of signs, signs for demonstrations. You know, you guys probably remember, as I do, used to be you'd go to a demonstration and somebody handed you the sign to carry. Mm -hmm. And it said, out now, or it had your union on it, depending on what it was. And a few people made signs. You know, I was a sign painter, I made signs. But now, people try to outdo each other. They have, it's just fabulous signs on the demonstration. Everybody makes their own signs. They're funny, they're poignant, they're perceptive. It, it's a new art form that's emerging. It's, it's great. I wish, I, if I was still teaching, I, I would love to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to get some teach a course on that. A show on signs. So back to your, your I'm mural. Sorry, yeah. back, no. to, back to censorship, yes. Yeah, let's talk and about let's go, it. Uh, in the next panel, uh, the March of the People yeah. about with the solidarity theme. So 
uh, let's um, we can look at um, different pieces of this. Well, yeah. With I did. It's a little synopsis of history. This this whole mural is based on really two. It it references two very important pieces of work from an art historical point of view. One is uh, the Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch, which kind of, I, without getting into all this stuff, it was like yeah. the beginning of capitalism, right? And, and I, I don't want to get into all this stuff. It's, it's this magnificent work. And it's, it's something everybody who goes studies art history has what? to study. And it was, it was this amazing visionary work at, during the time when capitalism was, be, was still a progressive force in the sense that it was producing, um, it was creating. You know, uh, there was a time when capitalism created stuff. It was brutal, it was deadly, it was bloody, but they built railroads, they built cities, they did all that. Now they don't do anything except steal stuff. Um, so that was one of the things. So in the Garden of Earthly Delights, there's a triptych, there's a scene before, the scene after, scene in the middle. So this is based on that. And the other piece with Diego Rivera's mural, um, uh, Man at the Crossroads looking into the future, the famous mural that was destroyed at Rockefeller Center. Um, if you watch the movie Cradle Little Rock, everybody, one of the best movies ever made by Tim Robbins, you'll, you'll learn about this stuff if anybody's out there. <laughs> um, and so those are two of the things, but then, you know, any artist, you're always, there's no such thing as an original idea, right? There's only, because everything you do, it's based on things you've seen or experienced, and you put it together in your own way. Uh, and so um, what I did in, in the centerpiece of this thing was to give a little sense of the struggles. Uh, here we see the indigenous people who were here and, and the revolution against uh, the British. Um, you know, and this was a capitalist revolution. Um, you know, and, and you know, there's big debates and there's a lot of new, uh, new uh, history that's being written because, of course, um, part one of the aspects was defending slavery. Um, uh, although, in general, it's a good idea not to have hereditary rulers who are descended from God, right? Um, right. Well, no <laughs> arguments on that. But there was a lot of gray area in there. Well, yeah. Well, it was a, it was a bourgeois revolution and and an incomplete revolution. Event, and then the Civil War was the end, was basically the undone part of that revolution. It was the overthrow of oh, of uh, the slaveocracy. The and these show different movements. That, you know, it's New York, but it's everywhere. Uh, the anti-Vietnam War movement. I have uh, different strikes. Um, that are in there. Malcolm X speaking at uh, the Audubon. There's the Black Power things. There's uh, women's demonstrations reproductive for reproductive rights, um, struggles for desegregation. It's not complete in any sense. It's just this red mass because that's how real change happens. Um, maritime workers. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's to give a little sense of where things go. And I brought it up to, um, to uh, Stonewall. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's the, well, that's I, yeah. I, I could talk for an hour on every one of these yeah. little things. Um, so. Um, but when you put it, you know, when you look at all of it, there have been a lot of mass movements to try to, change things, and, and some things have been changed. We have but an extraordinary history in this country that has been suppressed. Um, you know, I don't know if you're going to show the figures marching at the bottom. Uh, um, I have one picture with all of, the, okay. all of them, but this is, uh, yeah, this is the Stonewall. Stonewall Public And the Work Solidarity. And, yeah, people marching. It's a big red mass of people. And when I bring people in. When people visit Red Square, I, I have my own little museum of censored art uh, in New London. It's called Red Square. It's on Google Maps. 
Um, it's very informal. Um, it's not a it's not a business or an institution. It's just my work. I had a, I'm, I lucked into a big space, so I use it. Um, but all of those people. Um, well, I I start by when I when I bring people in. I I've paint I painted uh, Albert and Lucy Parsons into murals in Mexico and Chicago. And do you know who Albert and Lucy Parsons are? No. Okay. Well, do you know you know what May Day is, right? Sure. Okay. Well, May Day is the international holiday of the working class. Yeah, when I lived in Israel, that was our you don't work. Labor Day. Yeah, you don't work. If you're most workers in the world don't work on May 1st. May 1st is a commemoration, began as a commemoration of the Haymarket events in Chicago. Albert Parsons was one of the anarchist trade unionists who was executed, framed up and executed in the fight for the eight-hour day in Chicago. Lucy Parsons, who was an amazing uh, woman who was a uh, feminist. She was of African and Latino um, uh, descent. And had f these they were two of the century. The whole world celebrates the militancy of the North American working class. And we have been so robbed of our history that we don't even know it. And I'm, I'm not surprised. Now here you are, a very conscious person who's yeah. been involved in everything. Very few people would know who they are. Because of the civil rights movement, the fight for black studies, we learned some of the history. Before that, I can remember when there wasn't Malcolm X. You couldn't read Malcolm X, you didn't think he made sense. Before the women's movement, people didn't know anything about women's history. But we have yet to reclaim our own history. That, that has to happen. All those people I painted, nobody knows who they are, even though they are these incredible people the re that led enormous strikes and struggles. The fight for the eight-hour day, the, the organization of the industrial workers of the world, the fight for free speech. Um, the organization of industrial unions, the sit-down strikes, these movements transformed the world, not just the U.S., the world. And, and they might have stuck in more places than here. They <laughs> or stuck better in some other places. Well, they, it's been suppressed. It has been, uh, most workers have no idea of their history. Very militant, very militant history of the labor movement in this country. You know, armed struggles. 5,000 miners armed in the Battle of Blair Mountain, right? I just, <laughs> not to make precedence of that. Yeah, it's not, it wasn't in my high school or college history. No, no, it's not anywhere. And, and it's, it's all suppressed. And by, and by the way, art like I do, there's a long history of that too. And that's suppressed. You know, you showed one of the slides, it was, it was the, um, Patterson Silk Strike, the great pageant of the Patterson Silk Strike. Thousands of workers marched into Madison Square Garden and got up on the stage and performed. Um, there was, uh, workers did performance art. The Wobblies, in their free speech fights, would all learn poems. They would all learn different poems so that when they were in jail, they could recite poetry to each other. We have this rich history, but it's been suppressed. But that's the final panel that we're yeah. looking at. Yes. And this is called Another World is Possible. And because our history is suppressed, most people don't know what these things are. In other words, the images that I paint are uh, sometimes people don't know what that. Bread and roses is a symbol from the labor movement. And some people may know about bread and roses because it's it's been used a little bit, but the idea of bread and roses comes from uh, women strikers in, in um, Massachusetts uh, in, on the Lawrence Textile Strike who carried a banner that said, we want bread and roses too. We want economic well-being, but we want art and beauty in our lives. 
That's been an aspiration of working people. That's been taken from us. The, you know, the idea of the eight-hour day is non-existent. We work. That's all we do. We work. Well, that's what they try to get us to do. Right. Um, but as we're human beings, and the need to make art is as fundamental to us as breathing. People have to have creative outlets, and so there's always this fight that's going on. But I paint bread and roses into my murals. I paint symbols like that, and people have to go, well, what's that about? And I get a chance to explain it. So Mur it's pedagogical. Mural, murals are like a, a history lesson. Not just this one, but others that I have looked at also. Well, I, I, I try. <laughs> <laughs> I try, and, um, and when I was teaching, I was so proud of my students. Um, we, we actually just, the, the mural program at CCSU was also suppressed. No one knows it existed. It's the largest collection of murals at any institution in the world. There's over 100 murals, many of them on social issues the war, feminist issues, the drug addiction, you name it. And nobody knows about it, right? <laughs> it's just kept all kept invisible. Connecticut's best kept I, secret. I, well, <laughs> the history everywhere is suppressed. You know, how many people know about the strikes and struggles that took place in their own towns? In every town in this country, there were sit-down strikes and struggles and important fights, civil rights things. It's, it's wiped out. We know about the Amistad in New London, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there's all kinds of things that, that, that uh, uh, are just kept buried, you know, and it's the great, it's the great, uh, the great man theory of history. You walk, you walk around town, people put the names on their houses. I changed mine, I erased the Coit House, it's not the Coit House anymore, it says this, built by skilled workers, not, not dead rich guys. And it, they didn't yeah. build any houses. <laughs> they no, they lived in them. They didn't get their hands dirty. That's why in that last slide you showed, I mean, it, 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 it shows, um, it's just the little side things, but I don't know if yeah. you see up there, the, there's two women showing the capitalists had to, oh. had to clean and had to make something. <laughs> and uh, this is another world as possible, and we're all sitting around. We all get a piece of the pie. All the species are there, and the workers are sitting around. We all get to share it. And that, that, that structure in the background, I won't get into a long explanation, but it is one, it's one of the fabulous pieces of artwork that came out of the early years of the Russian Revolution, Vladimir Totlin's monument to the Third Communist International. Great visionary piece of work. That's for another, another time. Yeah. And as the final thing, this is called Another World is Possible, the armaments are buried. The armaments are buried. That's, that's, that's the task that we have now. Um, you know, for people of our generation, we got involved in, I, I was a little past the civil rights movement, um, but the anti-Vietnam War movement was central movement, and then the women's movement, the gay movement, the other social movements at their time. We were fighting to, to make a revolution. I was, uh, I became a socialist to transform the world. The stakes are much greater today. The are stakes are much greater today. And, um, and sadly, much of our generation is the problem. <laughs> well. I mean, it's an embarrassment, but, well, it's, but it's true. Well, yes and no. <laughs> I mean, the fact of the matter is that peop people today who have not seen a lot of change in the last couple of decades have no clue what it was like. You know, I was telling you yeah. before about what it was like when I was a little kid. What, what it was like before the women's movement. What it was like before the gay movement. I think it is true. I, f I get frustrated because it is very hard to convey how repressed the 50s were. It was a nightmare. The when people, when this make, make America Great Again, it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare for most people. And, um, you know, and this is, this is what, not gonna, and this, the movements changed everything. The, the anti-Vietnam War movement, before the anti-Vietnam War movement, they, 
think about the wars in World War I, World War II, what did they do? Everybody signed up to go. They marched down the streets. The brass bands played. It was every, you know, they, they succeeded in convincing people to be pro-war. Vietnam changed that. People are anti-war, and it, the U.S. still fights wars, but they can't fight wars the way they want to fight wars. They just, the U.S. ruling class just got kicked, the most powerful military machine in the world, just got kicked out of Afghanistan by a small group of backward people who aren't even supported by the population there. But the U.S. can't win because it can't send troops in. Can't send troops in. And you can't win wars without sending troops in. So we, we accomplished something. We accomplished a lot. We're well, still fighting yesterday's wars, though, unfortunately. Well, in a way, or trying to. Well, you know, I, I posted a thing today because um, it's the anniversary of the largest demonstration, anti-war demonstration that ever took place, which was not during the 1960s or the 70s. It was February 15th, what was it, 2004, prior to the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Worldwide demonstrations, millions of people all over the world, 25 million people at least, largest demonstration in history. People are more anti-war today, in my opinion. People are more radical today in their thinking. Um, and it's going to explode at some point because people are being driven uh, more and more. They're being impoverished more and more. Uh, things are getting worse for a lot of people. And people are scared. And it pops up here and there. You had demonstrations after Trump elections. You have, you know, Occupy before that. Black Lives Matter. It's not generalized yet, but it will at some point. I, I feel very confident about that. Now, the stakes are great, um, and there isn't leadership. That's the problem. There are no, there's no labor party. There's no revolutionary parties. There's small groups of people. I think there's some really good small groups of people, and I think young people today uh, there is a certain romanticization of the 1960s, and, and, and we know that it, there were some great things <laughs> to the 1960s. Yeah, it was a mixed bag, too. But people are much more open in their attitudes. They're much more thoughtful. They're much more international. They, they look at the whole world um, in a way that we couldn't. It didn't exist. The Internet didn't exist. The Internet was created as a weapon. It was originally a military weapon. And instead, the working class took control of it. And it's the same back and forth, but it's a place where there's huge political discussions going on. That is true. Okay, so we have two yeah. minutes. Yeah. So um, Back I, to censorship. Yeah. Well, I, I want to just show people the very last panel, which we won't really talk about because... Well, You're not going to name all the people, <laughs> no, but there are a bunch of them. But maybe in the last minute, if people want to see more of your art, either I know you have photographs of some things that were just actually destroyed. Uh, well, I, I have a museum of censored art. I have had murals there destroyed in New York. Really in in go through some of oh, these. they're just all over the place. Malcolm yeah. X was destroyed. That's in Iraq. It's a dog gone. Yeah. It's all gone. <laughs> so, so how do people get in touch with you to, to visit Alowitz, you? A-L-E-W-I-T-Z. You find me on Facebook or someplace like that, uh, Instagram, whatever. And Red Square is my studio and a gallery, and I ended up with this big place in New London. So I have uh, displays of all this stuff, and I, and I have uh, the city at the crossroads of history. I have banners, and I have... Uh, displays of things that have been censored. And if people are interested in learning more about this kind of stuff, in doing agitpop art, or if they're interested in socialism or whatever, um, get a hold of me. It's not hard. It's a Red Square is even on uh, Google. You, you know, it's on Federal Street. It's the old drop-in, for people in New London, it's well, the old drop-in learning Much center. more colorful than it was then. Uh, but yeah. Um, and I can attest to the fact that Mike responds when people get in touch with him. I do. And likes to show the work. And in a way, uh, one response to censorship is getting the word out by other channels. 
Well, you have to respond to it. And, and whenever I've been censored a lot, and uh, whenever that happens, we respond to it. You, you know, it's always, it's all, all of these ideas that we, we throw little pebbles into the water, we throw grains of sand, but you don't know where they go. Somebody's watching this tonight, might be the next Lenin, right? You don't know. We don't know. <laughs> and we, okay, so in our last 30 seconds, I'm just going to thank you and say, I'm glad you, no, we shouldn't have waited seven years to have you back on. We'll have to maybe do it Anytime. again sooner. Anytime. And, um, and we are going to, to post this on YouTube so people will be able to watch it. So just thanks for coming and sharing your art and to everyone out there. Uh, I think, I don't know what we're doing next week, really, but in two weeks, Glenn Cheney will be on talking about some of the books he's written recently. Well, thank you for and having me. And thanks for coming <laughs> on the show. Always and, a pleasure. Uh, talking about your art that otherwise people won't see. They can. If they can see it online. They can get the idea. <laughs>